um, now we are moving to the next um, talk. Um, our next speaker is uh, Barbara Yazak, and uh, she will uh, tell us. She will tell us about EIC. Barbara, are you there? Okay, I'm here. Let me share my screen. Great. So uh, you have 25 minutes, and uh, at the end of at the end of before 25 minutes, I will give you five minutes warning. Uh, I will just write on the screen. Uh, I won't. Oh, on my screen because. Uh, yeah, yeah. I will. I will just uh, uh, annotate annotate on your screen. Says five minutes. Okay. I'll. Uh, if not, if I don't uh, acknowledge it, it means that my goofy screen missed it. So shout at me, please. Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. Go. go ahead, please. Yeah. So it's my pleasure to tell you all about the physics of the EIC. Now, um, the pleasure is also a small problem in that um, I'm a newbie in much of this. So what you're going to get today is a heavy eye and experimentalist's view. And in 25 minutes, I'm going to uh, cover only a subset of the physics of the EIC, because that's all that's possible to do in a way that's um, understandable, in my opinion. So I'll start by talking about you know, presenting some overarching science goals. I'll tell you some basics about electron scattering for those who don't think about that all the time. I'll uh, cover a few topics in nuclear structure, nucleon structure, the goal being to elucidate, you know, what are the partons doing in there and how are they doing it? And then some things to learn from e-nucleus collisions. And I do want to spend a little bit of time on why jets are particularly interesting observables at the EIC, because I think that's a superb opportunity for people in Jetscape. So <clears throat> the big questions in the EIC actually can fall mostly under two, um, two umbrellas. One is how do nucleons emerge from quarks, gluons, and their interactions? Uh, good question. Um, what can you actually uh, measure and calculate to address that? Well, the makeup of the nucleon spin, its mass, <clears throat> uh, the parton arrangement and uh, interactions inside the nucleon. And uh, that's where uh, these magic things like TMDs and GPDs come in. And I'll talk about those a bit. <clears throat> the other question that's uh, I think very key for the EIC and what motivates the E plus nucleus collisions is how do partons interact inside dense QCD matter? Um, we, we know we want to better understand the nuclear modifications of PDFs and what's the physics at high gluon density. Um, there's a lot of uh, predictions and some hints that the density saturates so one of the things, uh, a discovery potential at the EIC is to look for the evidence of the saturation. Um, maybe more immediately relevant to Jetscape is what's the energy loss and transport in dense but cold QCD matter like? So I'll talk a bit about what we can do to answer those kinds of questions. Now, in um, electron proton or electron nucleus scattering, uh, there are certain processes that we more focus on. Um, what uh, so I've got I've got them kind of uh, outlined here. Um, I should comment if you go back to my front page, you will find an archive listing that is for the EIC yellow report, and there's tons of information in there. I've tried to uh, uh, condense out some of the uh, key stuff out of those 600 plus pages. Okay, so back to um, electron scattering. Well, there's deep inelastic scattering, and um, we're used to thinking about uh, inclusive deep inelastic scattering where um, you have an electron and a proton beam coming in. The electron uh, emits a virtual photon, which interacts with the, uh, uh, some of the ingredients of the proton, breaking it up or not. But what you measure in inclusive deep and elastic scattering is the scattered electron. And that actually pins down all of the uh, kinematics of the scattering remarkably. So what I've just shown you there is the neutral current inclusive deep and elastic scattering. There's also charge current uh, inclusive DIS. 
And that's where the exchange particle is a W, um, the electron disappears. And what you actually measure for the charge current is all the other stuff that comes out of the nucleon. There's semi-inclusive deep inelastic scattering. And that's where not only do you measure the electron, but also the associated hadron. And I should stop and ask, do you guys see my cursor here as the little arrow? Yes. Very good, thank you. Yes. The last um, key tool in uh, scattering electrons off of nucleons and also nuclei is the exclusive uh, deep and elastic scattering. And that's where what you measure is not just the electron and one of the other things, but the electron and everything else. So you'll see me uh, use these terms some. Um, I tried to put some of the basics of the kinematics together into one slide. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I'm pretty sure one slide isn't going to get it drilled into your bones. So I suggest if this is new to you, uh, take a screenshot of this slide and keep it someplace that you can refer to for the rest of this talk, and maybe also while reading the yellow report. So um, what happens? You, uh, you exchange a virtual photon. Its momentum is Q, which is the difference uh, of the momentum of the incoming and scattered electron. Its virtuality is the famous Q squared. Um, another very useful quantity is uh, W squared. And uh, W is basically uh, the center of mass energy for the photon nucleon system. And so you can calculate that uh, according to this equation here, where P is the nucleon momentum. Now the invariants uh, are X and Y. X is our usual um, famous X. And um, you can calculate it in various ways uh, that we're used to, and some that we, are, we in um, heavy ion collisions are maybe a little less used to. Uh, but you have the equations here. I just want to point out that another important uh, variable is nu, which is the energy transferred. And um, that's just calculated from the, measured by the difference between the incoming and outgoing electron. Um, in deep inelastic scattering, a key quantity is the inelasticity, y. Um, and that's just uh, calculated again, either from P and Q, or more usually in the experiment from uh, uh, one minus the ratio of the outgoing from the incoming lepton. Now, as you see from some of these things I've put up here uh, in the lab frame, in fact, all of these quantities can be calculated from the nucleon beam information and the uh, incoming and outgoing electron information, its energy and the scattering angle. And this is why inclusive deep and elastic scattering works and why people have learned so much from it, because all you have to measure for the inclusive is that scattered electron. Now, using these things, you can measure structure functions. What you actually do is you actually measure the cross-section of the scattered electron as a function of x and q squared. And then what you, uh, what you find is, uh, this is a combination of the uh, structure functions F2 and FL um, with longitudinally polarized electron and neutron beams. Then um, you measure the uh, double spin asymmetry, similar to what we're used to in Rick spin with two polarized proton beams. Um, but from that, you extract the structure function G1, and you'll see how that's used in a moment. So another thing that uh, I find it uh, very useful to try and get my head around when thinking about the EIC is what goes where. So as you can see from the arrows here at the top, you've got the proton or nuclear beam going to the right and the electron beam is heading to the left. So then this area on over here on the left is the electron going direction. And for a low Q squared process, low momentum transfer, that's where the electron ends up, of course, scattered by a smallish angle, uh, keeps lots of energy. 
the higher the Q squared, the more the electron gets kicked backwards towards the hadron going direction. The hadron going direction is here on the right. Traditionally, that's considered positive rapidity. And not too surprisingly, uh, the remnants of large X partons in the hadron beam go in this direction. And you know that's what you'd expect because they've got uh, a whopping beam energy and uh, they carry a large fraction of that. As you go down in X for partons inside the hadron, then as you smack them with an electron, you can smack them further and further into the electron going direction. So uh, low X uh, partons in the hadron beam end up over here on the left at negative rapidities. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the physics quantities then. I'm gonna first start with uh, what can you do to address the question, the big question of how do nucleons emerge from partons? Um, that's an easy question to ask and a tough question to answer. Well, you can measure their parton structure. I see somebody has put something into the chat. Oh, okay, that's not for my talk. Um, so first thing that I wanna talk about is the nucleon spin structure. This is something that uh, most of us are quite familiar with. As we know, the spin one half of the nucleon is carried um, not entirely by the uh, valence quarks. In fact, they carry only about 30% of the spin of the nucleon. <clears throat> Recent results from, the, um, from Rick show us that the gluons carry maybe 20 or 30% with the rest uh, to be searched for. Um, I just wanna highlight this very recent uh, uh, spin result from STAR. Uh, what's shown here is the double spin asymmetry for uh, jets in polarized proton collisions, plotted as a function of the jets xt. And you can see here that the um, new results in green agree pretty well with the old results in blue and uh, really verify that this DSSV14 curve um, is preferred. And so what the net effect of this uh, new result is, is to significantly reduce the uh, uncertainties in the uh, fits. The way you actually extract delta G from these kinds of measurements is through global fits of lots of data. And that's why the curves always have all kinds of nice uh, letters as, as you all know. Now, when we turn on the EIC and do uh, um, deep and elastic scattering there, uh, we should have a very large, uh, a large impact. Now, if you look here in the middle at the gluon spin, uh, this is uh, essentially the integral of delta G from some minimum X up to one, and it's plotted versus the minimum X. And what you can see is that with uh, the new RIC data, the projection is that uh, the error bars will be this kind of uh, uh, medium blue color. Uh, when we started, Rick, the error bars were this uh, uh, aqua color, so we didn't know diddly squat. When we turn on the EIC, you'll see that the uh, much better information from Rick will actually be pinned down very, very well down to X of 10 to the minus six. Um, that plus the improvements in the uh, knowledge of the quartz spin is going to be very key to measuring, to uh, inferring the orbital angular momentum. There are also measurements that can get at that more directly, but that's tricky. And the other thing that one will do is get at the neutron information by um, scattering polarized electrons off of polarized deuteron beams. So to close in on the orbital angular momenta, it's, uh, this is a plot that shows you why the EIC is an important way to do that. So what's plotted here is the x-axis is the integral of the gluon and the quark spins from x of 10 to the minus three up to one. And on the y-axis, it's the integral from uh, 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus three. I just showed you that uh, the, the y-axis quantities are extremely poorly known. And so uh, DSSV14 tells us this big aqua um, ellipse is you know, where the truth might lie. 
if you look here on the right that shows the um, reach at the EIC, you can see that this triangle here below uh, X of 10 to the minus three is what's going to allow us to go from this uh, aqua ellipse to these blue, uh, much, much smaller area circles. And that's important because if it ain't in the uh, quarks and nor in the gluons, the spin's got to be carried by the orbital angular momenta of the particles. Of course, parton distributions will tell us something about that also. I want to start with the longitudinal parton distributions. Here is a plot that all of us have uh, seen that shows the uh, cross-section for deep and elastic scattering as a function of Q squared with bands for different regions of X. And these are inclusive deep and elastic scattering. And those then uh, were used to extract the uh, actual um, uh, densities of valence quarks, gluons, and C quarks. Again, this was done by just measuring the outgoing electron. Now with the EIC, we will have uh, tons more data, and that's going to allow us to do not just those kinds of measurements, um, in a somewhat different X range and also in nuclei, but something um, more dimensional or more highly dimensional, I should say, and if you think about it, if you start by thinking about the Wigner distribution, which is the distribution of your partons inside a proton, as you see in this picture, in momentum and space, this is obviously a six-dimensional uh, uh, spatial and momentum distribution object, um, that'd be great to measure. So how, do you, how can you get at that? Well, if you integrate the Wigner distribution over the spatial dimensions, then what you get is uh, the distribution in, uh, in the momentum three dimensions. We just looked at the one integrated, just leaving the longitudinal direction, but you can get the transverse momentum distributions that way. And from those, you can uh, learn about the uh, uh, transverse momentum dependence of where the, the partons live. I'll say a bit more about that in the next slide. Conversely, you can integrate over momenta, um, over the momentum directions, and then you can get the impact parameter distribution, um, which tells you the uh, average density of the partons inside the nucleus as a function of the transverse direction here. And those are the generalized parton distributions. So let's talk a little bit about the TMDs. Um, I, as I said, I'm a newbie to this. And so my first question was, oh man, TMDs, what are these things? Well, what they do is they measure the correlation between the nucleon spin and the PT of the partons. Um, if you think about it, you can uh, expect that there would be eight of these objects. Um, and you know, here are their names in this nice little picture here. Before I talk any more about this, I want to uh, point you to a beautiful lecture uh, that was given some years ago, actually, at Jefferson Lab from Bolion. Um, that has not only these nice pictures, which I find useful as an introduction, but uh, if you want to know the theory of how you can calculate these things and what each one actually means in terms of uh, the, what the partons are up to, please have a look at those lecture notes. I think for the purpose of this talk, I just want to uh, point out that uh, you can actually um, identify all of these uh, eight TMDs into a table as Biketa has done. And if you look at this table of nucleon polarization versus quark polarization, then you can start to see what you learn from these things. Um, here, for both of them unpolarized, you have F1, which is our normal unpolarized uh, uh, structure functions. If both, if the nucleon is longitudinally polarized, then you look at the longitudinal polarization for the longitudinal polarization for the quarks, then you get the G1 that I uh, talked about earlier. 
If both are transversely polarized, then you get these transversity functions, which I'm sure everybody here has heard uh, talks about at various RIC meetings. Um, other, uh, other famous ones of these things are the Sievers and the bohr molders functions. The Sievers is something we've heard a lot about. And if you wonder why that thing is famous, well, that came up a long time ago as an explanation for observed single spin asymmetries off of polarized targets. Uh, even when those single spin asymmetries were expected to go to zero, they didn't. Um, a recent uh, prediction about this uh, Sievers function for unpolarized quarks in a polarized nucleon is that it should change sign in deep and elastic scattering versus Drellian, and that's something that's being looked for at RIC in the near future. So how do you measure these TMDs? Well, what you need to do is you need to do semi-inclusive deep and elastic scattering with different combinations of the electron and proton polarization. Remember, your goal here is to get at the transverse quark polarizations. So you can't just do longitudinal. You need semi-inclusive deep and elastic scattering because you want to identify the produced hadron in order to quark to tag the flavor of the quark. Oh man, I'm way too slow. Um, anyhow, you can measure various things, uh, dihadrons and dijets and charm to get at the gluon TMDs. What you get is a uh, bunch of um, a, a bunch of cross section measurements that looks like this, and um, what you can do is again, arrange them according to X and Q squared. And then these are the cross sections as a function of PT and um, the Z of your hadron. And so you map out these structure functions. And what you will get is you can measure the Sievers function that way to this much improved, um, much improved precision. Now the GPDs, they relate the hadron form factors to the parton uh, longitudinal momentum and transverse position. Remember, these are to get at the transverse positions. There's eight of these beasts, and they're useful because their Fourier transform gives you the quark and gluon spatial densities. Now, to measure these, you have these um, magic looking handbag diagrams. And I have to tell you, the first time I saw this, I went off and bought a cheap little handbag that has this shape just to prove that it really is a handbag diagram. Anyway, what happens in these, you uh, exchange um, a virtual photon, but that beast interacts with only a single parton here in your nucleon. And what you get out uh, very frequently is a real photon. You can ensure that the exchange is just with a single parton by measuring not only this the outgoing electron and the outgoing photon, but also very forward this uh, scattered nucleon and make sure it didn't break up. And that's known as deeply virtual Compton scattering because it's a Compton scattering process. You can also make a lepton pair or a meson. And through that, you get these Compton, uh, uh, Compton FFs, which uh, then the, tell you what the, uh, what the position distributions look like. For the theorists, which I know is most of you, the best place to look that I found is the thesis of Marcus Deal. Um, have, a, uh, have a look at that, it's nicely written. Measuring these is hard, the cross sections are small and you need a boatload of bins. And that's why mapping the GPDs will require very high uh, luminosity. Okay, let me get to the nuclei. I may have to steal a few extra minutes, I'm sorry about that. Um, First question is, you know, how does uh, binding affect the uh, parton distribution functions inside nuclei? This is something that all of us know that we've been dealing with from Jetscape. And you can see that the improvements from uh, the EIC uh, get substantial at the higher Q squareds. And that's because um, the EIC coverage in X and Q squared, you can see here in this light blue, and so you go to much smaller X and to higher Q squared than what's currently known. The measurements at the EIC will look like this. You're used to all of them. Um, so I'm not gonna talk more about it, except to point out that 
by uh, looking, doing deep and elastic scattering and requiring uh, associated charm particle that actually can allow us to extract the gluon distributions from F2 charm and FL charm. Now going to the map of uh, QCD matter, um, of course, we are quite interested in what happens when the parton density gets high. As, uh, as you know, uh, as the density gets higher and your resolution gets higher, you get into this realm where, the, where you should have a nonlinear evolution and saturation. So let me skip this. So the experimental signatures of saturation at the EIC that we know to look for today are suppression of dihadron angular correlations by measuring the scattered electron and two hadrons in the, um, and this kind of suppression has been seen already in forward uh, angles at RIC. Um, we can do uh, semi-inclusive gamma plus dijet production, uh, again, to look at the gluon density and coherent diffraction whose cross-section is proportional to the square of the uh, uh, gluon density. The coherent diffraction you can actually separate from the incoherent case of which there's lots by uh, detecting the nucleus remnants in the very forward directions. And that's why you hear people talking about Roman pots and far forward uh, measurements. Now turning to energy loss, um, that actually we have a great opportunity to uh, characterize cold dense QCD matter with semi-inclusive DIS off of low X gluons. Uh, and you can imagine that if you have an electron proton scattering, uh, this is what we're kind of used to that the quark uh, flies off in the proton direction. But if you're looking at very, very small X, it's more like a fixed target experiment. And then your, uh, your quark and its remnants go off um, actually into the electron going direction. These are some simulations from a paper that I have the pleasure of being a co-author on. And if you require uh, um, that, if you ask where do all of the jets uh, above four GeV go, okay, mini jets, if you will, and you plot it as a function of um, X and eta of the jet, you find that the uh, low X jets go off in the uh, electron going direction as, as you would expect. You also find that uh, at those etas, the jets are really soft. Now, oops, those are really worthwhile looking at because by uh, measuring the jet, you know about the struck parton and you can, thanks, I see the zero minutes, yes. The struck parton, um, then you can actually directly measure the energy loss by uh, looking at the energy balance with the electron and how that is uh, affected by being in a nucleus. The rest of the event is very clean, which means we can find these very soft jets. Also means we can use R equals one, so the hadronization uncertainties become very small. And then we can directly measure the energy loss to the cold dense matter. Um, other uh, interesting jet observables, uh, I talked about the energy balance there's also the opening angle distribution between the lepton and the jet to look at jet PT broadening. You can look at uh, dijet correlations and their modifications. And then there are a whole host of interesting substructure variables that uh, like angularity and the energy flow and quantum number correlation inside jets that can let you really get at the uh, interactions details of the interactions of your uh, struck parton with the uh, dense nuclear uh, the QCD matter inside. If you look in the bright frame, which is the frame of the uh, scattered electron and the, uh, sorry, not the scattered electron, the, uh, the transferred um, virtual photon, then you can actually, by dialing the size of the uh, nucleus dial how much matter your jet goes through as it hadronizes and look at the hadron formation in jets. Um, now my last, my just about la my last slide with uh, EIC physics has some other, uh, other interesting physics that can be done with uh, jets at the EIC. 
You can use the jets to study high energy photon structure. You can use jets again to measure the gluon helicity in polarized protons. Here you see a nice plot of the uh, double spin asymmetry of dye jets at the EIC, and that will uh, allow us to get to uh, smaller x for the uh, glu for the uh, gluon helicity. Uh, you can do uh, gluon TMD measurements, and then an example of that is here. Um, if you look in uh, the bright frame, so here's the photon, here's the here's the uh, remnant of the, the jet, then you can extract the Sievers asymmetry in, uh, from the electron jet correlation and get at the TMDs via jets without having to pay the price of folding in the uncertainty from, a, uh, from the hadronization. Um, and we will start to be able to study the hadronization via jet substructure. Now, I'm not going to say more about it today because I think this is a place where the Xscape collaboration can have a huge impact. Um, because we all tell each other we're going to measure jet substructure and uh, hadron production to study hadronization, but how we connect things we can measure to the process of hadronization, I think, is pretty unknown. And there's a really nice big turf for Xscape. And um, all of this has defined a number of experimental requirements, which are given here in this table. You can also find it in the yellow report. And at the moment, three detector concepts. This one is ETCHA, there's one called CORE, and there's one called Athena that attack these uh, measurements in slightly different ways and complementary ways in many cases. And so I just want to summarize by uh, saying that uh, we're going to do a whole variety of measurements by using the uh, range of center of mass energies and the high luminosities that are planned at the EIC uh, according to this rough map. I'll stop here and thank you for your patience with my going over. Well, thank you, Barbara, uh, for this very, very uh, nice overview of uh, the physics uh, of at the upcoming EIC. Um, Stefan, do you see any uh, question comments in Slack? Uh, no, nothing in the Slack channel. Okay. I've overwhelmed you all and just told you stuff you know anyway, right? Well, the so I'm just curious so that uh, the the in principle you can also instead of I mean in addition to jet you can also do uh, like single like charge pop. Right. Oops. Ah. Hello? Uh oh. I can, I can hear you. Who's frozen? Okay. I wasn't sure if he was frozen or my screen was frozen. Let me. I think I understand where his question was going. If I. So if you look at this plot, you see here uh, in this complicated plot, uh, the electrons are in the top hemisphere, the uh, hadron is in the bottom hemisphere, the uh, uh, position of the clock corresponds to the eta. I think I, I'm trying to answer the question I thought you were asking. So let me finish and then you can tell me that I'm a dope and I should answer a different question, which is probably the case. The, along the radius, you see the um, energy of the uh, electron or the struck parton. And um, so what you see is that when you require X between uh, you know, eight times 10 to the minus three and 10 to the minus two, then, you know, as you expect, the parton goes in the electron direction. The reconstructed jets look like this. You have one jet in the struck parton direction. You have a forward jet that's the remnant of the, the struck beam, of course. Now, I don't have it here, but if you uh, only measure a single hadron, these distributions are much, much wider. And so it's much more difficult to say, ah, this particular hadron corresponds to the struck parton because you get a lot more confusion with the jet remnant. 
And so I think that's a real strength of Jets that you don't always hear about so often. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, actually, my connection just went out for like briefly for one minute while you're talking, but I'm... <laughs> I hope I answered the right question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, this is always the problem working from home. My internet sometimes uh, eggs up. Uh, Mine too, especially when my husband gets on it too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, are there any other questions from the uh, from the audience or comments? Doesn't sound like it. Yeah. Oh well. If not, we should let, let me let us thank uh, Barbara again um, for her talk. And uh, our next talk um, will be uh, on Re Revert by Christine uh, Natchez from University of Tennessee. And uh, you have twenty five minutes, and I will give five minutes warning uh, before uh, at twenty. Okay. Thank you. Um, 